certainly was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything until I know wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. Join your voice with mine today, church. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Thank you, Father, for your sacrifice on that cross and for loving us so much, God. Because we know that all the love that we have to offer, God, all we love you and all the love we have to show others from you, God, it's just that. It's from you first. It's because you first loved us that we're able to love you back and love our brothers and sisters. You are stronger. There is love that came for us, humble to the sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness. None can deny Through the storm And through the fire There is truth That sets me free Jesus Christ Who lives in me You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken You have saved me it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Beginning and no end, you're my hope and my defense. You came to seek and save the lost, you paid it all upon the cross. Lord, you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken. You have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Oh, you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Our Lord of all, so let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher. 
Vi lyfter hajer så lätt som ni Vi lyfter hajer Vi lyfter hajer Vi lyfter hajer You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken You have saved me It is written Christ is risen Jesus you are Lord of all Can you sing that with me one last time man? Make it our declaration God You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken You have saved me It is written Christ is risen Jesus you our Lord of all, you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all, Jesus you are Lord of all, Jesus you our Lord of all. We praise you in this house, God. Somewhat of a transition going from the Pentecostal music leader to the Methodist sermon. In fact, we were, I was at a Doing a funeral. If I tell you all the same story two or three times, just tolerate it, okay? Because I'm not ready to hear you repeating yourself. I'm not old enough for that. So anyway, uh, we were there in, in uh, visitation, and one of the ladies had a bulletin, and she was just fanning herself. She said, it is so hot in here. And I said, just hang on, it'll cool off. I'm a Methodist. So just understand that we're a little more relaxed and, and laid back, and a little quieter than, than the music is. Thank you, Manny, for leading us and getting our blood story. I also told you when I told you my story about how I was treated in that older adult Sunday school class. Do you remember, do you remember me saying, see, I know I've already said this, that uh, when I walked in there about how nervous I was about teaching that class, I said, look, you're the people that raised me. I don't know how I'm ever going to tell you anything that you don't already know. And the lady said, well, we forgot most everything. So if you just want to start over, that'll be okay with me. So I don't know anything about y'all. I am assuming that you're pretty well schooled on what it means to be a Christian just from watching what goes on in this church. But what I want to do is just kind of start over and give you the sermon. That if you can get this message and if you can live by it, that you don't really need to know anything else. And it goes back to Jesus when he gave the when he was asked what is the greatest commandment? And what he says. This is in uh, 22 starting at verse Matthew 22 starting at verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So just think about that. What is it we're supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all your mind. Pretty simple commandment but very hard to live. Very hard to live. In fact, this came actually out of, uh, out of the Old Testament, and it was part of the, uh, the Jewish commandment. It's called the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Meaning, there's only one God. And then what followed was, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. The first and greatest commandment. But then he says, Jesus wouldn't leave it simple with one commandment. 
He said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said that's, that's the greatest commandment. Do that and you will live. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, is sometimes even harder to live out than the first one. But what he said following was, everything else, all the law and the prophets, everything that we see in the Old Testament, hangs on those two commandments. Everything falls under those two commandments. So what makes it, what makes it hard to be a good Methodist? Is that we tend to look deeper and deeper and deeper into our faith. And I think as we go along, I'm going to kind of follow along with that uh, John Wesley tradition of looking at some of his teachings about what it means to fall deeper and deeper in love with God and to understand more and more about what it means to serve Him and to love Him. But why are these so important? Why would Jesus say this? Why wouldn't He say the Ten Commandments? Well, you know, when you look at the Ten Commandments, what follows them is about, we estimate, 620 other laws that follow after that. So, why can't we just live by ten? Well, God said, you can live by those ten, but here's the other things you need to do. So, it gets so difficult because nobody knows what all of those laws are. Nobody can quote all of those laws. So, how do we live our lives if we can't even know what they are? Well, we live our lives by judging everything that we do based on what Jesus just told us. Love the Lord your God with all, with everything that you have. With all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. It was kind of interesting. I think it was Thursday night at, at recovery. The statement was made. You can't follow that one unless you love yourself. That you don't you can't know how to love someone else unless you know how to love yourself. And we're not going down that down that, but I just thought it was interesting that that actually came up. But what happens when we just try to live by the simple rules? What if somebody just you know, people say, just give me the Ten Commandments. Just give me the Ten Commandments. Well the issue with trying to live out those commandments is just like with everything else, just like with all the laws that our government puts up, there's always loopholes. There's always ways around everything in there, and so we tend to interpret those for our own benefit. So when you go back into Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 20, you shall have no other gods before me. What he really meant was you will have no other gods in my presence. That they should not exist. But sometimes when we read that, what do we turn that into? Well, God should be our highest priority, but then maybe these other things can be just a little lower than that. See? We tend to try to make loopholes and figure out some way around it because we can't give God all of our attention, right? It's too hard. And so we do that. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth underneath or in the waters below. You can have no images. In fact, back when I worked at Olin, we had a friend that got real involved in this. I should have brought it this morning. He actually went to Rio and he had a, a little wooden carving of Christ on the cross. You know, the one where he's... Christ is out over the, the city and he's got his arms out and it's carved out of stone. He had a little wooden one. And he said, and he finally decided that was a great image. And he couldn't have any image like that. And I said, well, if you don't want it, can I have it? Because <laughs> I didn't see it like that. It's, it doesn't have any power, anything like that. But the problem is when we start making those images and we start making them into our own image, and I think we talked some a couple weeks ago in Sunday school about that. Why is it when, uh, when God said... Uh, to make an altar to me, don't carve your stones out. Because you're going to make it fancy and it's going to become about you instead of about me. And so he says, don't do anything. Don't carve those things because you begin to make them into your image. And you know and then what else? If we finally make an image and we say, well, God, this is an image of God and, and then suddenly we start believing that God's in that 
image and that's the only place that he is and you know I think I'm just going to put this in the cabinet for right now and close the door up and now I can do whatever I want to because God's locked up in there and you can't do anything <laughs> See how we take those things and we change them around you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name so what do we take that what does that actually mean? What it means is that you should not curse someone using God's name. Because back then, and I don't know, it may still hold true, and we just don't pay attention, but when you curse somebody in God's name, they were cursed. That's just like when the patriarch would, uh, would call his children together and bless them. They got whatever that blessing was, and sometimes it wasn't pleasant. And that was the, that was the rest of their life. And so what do we take that and turn it into? Well, don't say the G word. As long as you don't say that word, you're following that commandment. That's not it. That's not it. What it is is that we should not misuse God's name. We shouldn't give credit something to God that God didn't do. We shouldn't also take credit for something God did. See how complicated that is when you look at that? And we take it and we try to make it so simple. So when we look at these things, if we love God with all of our heart, then we don't misuse His name. If we love God with all of our heart, then we don't have anything that competes with Him for our priorities. And then when we look at our relationship with other people, how about honoring your father and mother? What does that mean? What does it mean to honor your father and mother? Well, it might mean we just have a nice big tombstone in the graveyard where they are and and we honor them by what we said on that. But what's it being talked about there? Let's talk about honor the teachings. Honor what they've taught you. Now, everybody's not a great parent. And so you can't really look at this and say this always applies in every case. But if the mother and the father have taken seriously that commandment to love God and to love their neighbor, their child, as God would love them, then yes, we should respect them and live our lives by what they taught us. Love our neighbors ourselves. You shall not murder. Well, what does that mean? What if they just needed killing? <laughs> you know, you ever said that? You ever heard anybody say that? Yeah, they just need to kill them. Well, what does it mean do not murder? It means don't take somebody's to somebody's life unlawfully. There are there are crimes in here. There are laws that are broken that so or people are supposed to be stoned. But even at that, should we take that a little bit more seriously and look at that? And it's like, would we really take another person's life? Even if they deserve it? No, we shouldn't do that. Because why? Because we're loving our neighbor. Even if they're not very loving. We're loving our neighbor and we need to take seriously what God said for us to do. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now that one actually goes back to, uh, to the way the, the, the law was set up back then. For someone to be convicted of a crime, you know what it took? Two witnesses that agreed on what happened. So somebody could be hauled into court, which is what they tried to do with Jesus a lot what they tried to do with the disciples a lot. So they were hauled into court and all they had to do was find two people that would agree they did something wrong and the judge would convict them. But would you give that false testimony to convict somebody if you were loving your neighbor as much as you loved yourself? So you see how these laws, there's always loopholes around us. There's always ways that we interpret them that, that don't really end up meaning what God intended for them to mean to us. So what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and strength and, and all those other words that people put into it? What does that mean? That means we put everything that we have into our love for God. It doesn't mean that all we do is sing Amazing Grace 24 hours a day. But what it does mean is that everything that we do we stop and we look and, 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 and we ask ourselves, am I loving God by what I am doing at this very moment? 
think also Thursday night, which is not the first time I'd heard it. The difference in reacting and responding. I hear that a lot when I work at the prison. It's part of the, the Kairos weekend. One of the talks says, there's a big difference in reacting and responding. Reacting is when you do the very first thing that comes to your mind, which is why a lot of people are in the prison to begin with. It's because something happened and they got real angry and they just did what they wanted to do. Instead of count to ten. And let's think about what it is that we're getting ready to do. So if we are loving God with all of our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind, when something happens that we don't agree with, when something happens that we want to take an action about and the first thing you want to do is pop somebody, what do you do? Wait a minute. Who am I following? What is it I'm supposed to do? Am I going to be loving God by this action that I'm going to take? And we stop and we think about it. And once we play with that in our head for a little while, hopefully we come to the position where we say, it's probably not a good thing to do. My first impulse, my first reaction is not something that I want to do. Because why? Because I've put God first in my life. And what I want to do is do what He wants me to do. And so we don't take that action. Now, if I can't take that immediate action, what do I do? What does it mean to respond? Well, it means to take an action. But it means to take an action based on what God would have us do. So what it does for us, it kind of slows our lives down just a little bit if we are really serious about following God. Because we just don't continue to do and do and do and do and do. We stop and we think. And we act. And we stop and we think. And we act. And what that does is, what does that do? Puts God higher in our priority list. It could, puts God higher in, in, in the way that we think about things. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. Wesley says it's a whole lifetime of getting perfect. It's a whole lifetime of figuring out how this works. But what it does is, it causes us to ask God, what should I do in this situation? And am I going to make the world a better place by the action that I take? Am I going to be loving my neighbor as much as I would love myself? And if we love ourselves and we know what we would want, then we want the same thing for that person that we sometimes just really don't like a whole lot. But what it means is, if we can do that, maybe they come to the understanding that God loves them too. Because sometimes you just get asked, why didn't you do something? Well, it really wasn't God's plan. People stop and think. Is this guy really asking what God would have him do before he does something? Or is this woman stopping and asking what God would do before they do something? You know, just maybe. Just maybe that opens the door for the Holy Spirit to speak to them and say, yeah, that's what they do. Why aren't you doing a little more of that? And the world becomes a better place because of what we do. So just let me tell you, it's not an easy life. And I'm not here to claim that I do it all the time. But what I do know is the teaching. And what I do know is what we're supposed to do. And what I do know is that, that when I have an opportunity to act, even if it's something where I can have a negative reaction, I do stop and think, is this what God would have me do? Is this going to benefit anybody else? Am I responding in the way that God would have me respond? There was a story I was reading. We're in a pastor study, and, and, and the book had to do written by a pastor, but it had to do with his reaction at an airport when they canceled his flight. And it was not a pretty picture with him and the, uh, the uh, gate attendant there of trying to get him on a flight, and he pretty much pitched a fit. But what he was doing was telling us that story to give us the opportunity to think about that and to have a different reaction than what he did for us to stop and to respond. You know, and sometimes I think a really good, handy thing to do would be for all pastors to actually wear that clerical collar. <laughs> yeah. 
Wouldn't that just really restrict you? <laughs> Wouldn't that just really limit your response to things? If you knew that you had the collar on and everybody else knew that you had the collar on, you're just frozen. It's like, I can't do what I want to do. Didn't Paul even say that? I do the very things that I don't want to do. But sometimes we need maybe to identify ourselves. Maybe we need to wear the cross around our, our, our neck. Maybe sometimes we need to have a badge that says, I'm a Christian. Watch me. But we can't do that. Because our response is not always what it should be. And we don't always live the way that God would have us live. And we don't always project that Christian image into the world. But that's the next part of the story. Is what do we do? Am I a better person today than I was yesterday? And do I intend to be a better person tomorrow? Not based on what we think, not based on what we want, but what God wants. Tomorrow, is God going to look at me and say, he's doing a little bit better than he did yesterday. He's really, he's really managed this one situation and it looks like he's, he's progressing and he's coming along. Not that I'm to the point where I get well done my good and faithful servant. But it's like, I can see you made some progress here. I can see you made some progress here. So we're going to be talking in the, the next couple of three weeks about making that progress and how we do that. It's called sanctifying grace. It's become, we become more and more of what God wants us to be. And I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to make an assumption that we all know the first part. We all know about justifying grace. We all know what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ. But for me, that's just the first day of the rest of your life. And what do you do with that? That's what we do with the rest of our life is that we want to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And that every day we get better at doing that. So we're going to close with a song. And As we sing this, I want you to think about it. Think about your response or your reaction to God. About what He calls us to do and how well we do that. All of you decide to do a little help about becoming more of what God wants you to be. Amen.
these from us. I'm not just there walking about us all the time. But that's the road that we travel as a Christian. That's what makes it hard to be a good Christian. But that's the road that we travel. Becoming more and more what God wants us to be. Go forth from this place. Bring joy to your family, to your friends, to the people that you meet. But most of all, bring joy to the heart of God. Amen.